Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. Our interview today is with Suzanne Summers. You all know who she is, of course. Uh, she has achieved really extraordinary success uh, as an actress, as a singer, as a comedian, uh, but she is also a New York Times bestselling author 14 times over. Uh, she has been voted the Las Vegas Female Entertainer of the Year. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she has really put herself in a position of uh, really being a voice for alternative and integrative medicine. Her latest book is called Tox Sick, and we're going to be talking about that book today. Uh, this also is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, Suzanne is founder of foreverhealth.com, which is a, an online resource that's dedicated to uh, connecting patients with doctors who specialize in natural medicine and in, in integrative medicine. She has authored more than 25 books, and as I mentioned, 14 of them became uh, New York Times bestsellers. Uh, she has been uh, lecturing at uh, both professional as well as lay uh, groups uh, for some time uh, in terms of leveraging uh, the information that she has uh, gained by interacting with physicians and others involved in healthcare over the years and in fact has been very candid about her health related issues as well. So I'm really looking forward to this interview. Here we go. So Suzanne, this is a, a real honor and a pleasure for me. And I wanted to start off by asking, uh, what's a nice girl like you writing a book like this all about? I mean, we know what you've done in your career and here you write this really fantastic book. How does that happen? It's crazy, isn't it? You know, I always say life is a journey you can't plan. And um, what is it in life? You know, um, you have to look at the negatives as gifts. And 15 or so years ago, and I say or so because it's so it's such a non-event in my life now because I've moved so far past it, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And instead of um, saying, poor me, I remember saying, what have I done in my diet and lifestyle to play host to this disease. And that began this journey. And I'm 26, 26 books later now. It's been quite a journey, quite an education. So I only can look at cancer as a gift. It is what it literally uh, shook me by the shoulders and made me think about every choice that I make and had been making and that every choice matters. So that's how I got into this. And then it was a series of events. The first series of events was, um, why do we get sick? The next series was, why was I gaining weight? The next was, uh, where are my hormones? And then after hormones, it went naturally into toxins, interrupting the whole hormonal endocrine system. So it's been a journey that's had an organic progression. It's so interesting. I, I love this this facet of my career. Well, you, you've said some things just now that I think I, I really want to just uh, reiterate a little bit. And the first thing was, you know, immediately with that diagnosis, what did you do? You asked a simple question, and that is why, basically, why me? Mm -hmm. And it, it just seems so common in our society that people generally just want to live their lives come what may. And then when suddenly something happens, they develop a problem. Uh, they're hoping that there's going to be a quick fix, some kind of magic pill or other kind of therapy to pull them out of the hole that they may very well have dug for themselves. And, you know, as I look through the various books that you've re uh, written over your career, it's really uh, a constant theme is about uh, empowerment. It's about learning about what's going on and then what in the heck can I do about this? I mean, how do I leverage this new information to keep myself healthy and, and keep myself out of, out of trouble? I want to focus uh, on your new book, which I think is fantastic. And again, uh, in the introduction, I talked about this book. I think it's really uh, uh, very timely uh, on the day today that uh, the FDA announced that it was going to start screening foods for glyphosate, the herbicide found in Roundup. That was announced this morning. That's I don't huge. Know when this is going to air. But, you know, I think people are starting to take notice of the fact that environmental issues to which we are exposed are playing a pivotal role in our health. That's obviously the cornerstone uh, of your book. 
And I liked the way you began with that uh, little anecdote about Billy Casper. How did you hear about that? Well, it's, it's, it, I don't exactly know how I found that quote, but there it was in front of me. And it was so apropos because here I live in the desert and it's the land of golf courses. We don't live on a golf course. And I tell you, Dr. Perlmutter, pretty much everybody I know who has the luxury of living on a golf course has medical issues. Either breast cancer or prostate cancer, male or uh, female prostate or cancer. male. I, I hear you, I've been saying that for decades. Not able to absorb testosterone in the case of males that I've talked to, women whose hormones are never right, unexplained headaches, rashes, um, fatigue. One, uh, this one man was telling me, he said, it really bothers me. He said, I sit out on my deck on the golf course in the morning. I'm really enjoying my morning coffee and, and my paper. And he said, and then that machine comes around where they spray all the pesticides on the lawn and I have to go inside. And I think to myself, going inside is not going to protect you. It's inside. It doesn't decide to just stay outside. And you know, he has a wife who has um, autoimmune diseases and a lot of unexplained conditions. I don't think anybody is understanding how intoxicated we all have become. You, and you mentioned in your book about how these things, other things that outgas, for example, how invisible this is, and we're totally unaware of what we're being exposed to. You also talked about, uh, as I recall, plastic uh, bottles, the bottled water that come on pallets and sit out in the sun, and all of these unseen issues that are clearly important for us in terms of our health. Well, you and I look like we're around the same age, and I don't know, when you were a kid, I'm sure you did the same thing. Remember you had your wagon, and you went around in the neighborhood, and you Radio collected... Radio flyer. <laughs> oh, you had the good one. <laughs> and and <laughs> you collected bottles from all your neighbors, so you could take them in, and you got uh, two and a half cents for the small ones, and five cents for the, the big ones. You could pick up three, three, four, five dollars on a really good haul. Um, the the significant thing there is a uh, I was I had a my own little personal business, but secondly, we weren't drinking out of plastic bottles. We weren't drinking water that had phthalates outgassed in intoxic in toxic. I interviewed Dr. Sherry Rogers, who's an extraordinary environment environmental doctor, and she said if a pregnant mother drinks um, water out of plastic bottles during your pregnancy, her child will, um, can have a lower IQ. So I, I, I was struck in writing this book of how we are not preparing the womb, uh, how um, doctors, gynecologists are not understanding that when a woman gets pregnant, how important it is that her gut flora is balanced perfectly and that before conceiving if women were educated you would as a doctor put that woman on a, the kind of diet that would heal her gut lining so she didn't have leaky gut so she didn't have toxins running around in her bloodstream because in your book you talk about it and in my book i talk about the explosion of brain diseases ADD, ADHD, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, all these things that in particular the initials ADD, ADHD, OCD is so commonplace that it's half of the school and the children uh, are on amphetamines and brains that aren't fully formed yet taking amphetamines it sure seems to me and I know that you mentioned this in your book too, that it's an experiment that we're trying on all of us with no idea of the outcome. But people like you and me who are really interested are starting to notice, I think we're seeing the outcomes right now. We're seeing it in this explosion of the no 80s. Doubt. Um, you know, so so what, what I thought was interesting to finish up on Billy Casper, that he's, this is his career, this is his life, it's healthy, it's walking, it's out the green grass, and yet he can't, he, his, he's almost, it was describing a kind of paralysis. And his doctor said he had acute, acute pesticide poisoning. Yeah, and you know, 
uh, everybody's in a tizzy right now about Zika virus. At least, you know, we're here yes. in Florida. Oh, it's the next horrible right. thing. You don't need to worry about Zika virus when your neighbor is spraying their lawn with uh, pesticides and herbicides and who knows what, and you're breathing that. So the Zika virus is, is really the last thing you need to be concerned about. But and also, and also um, just to, to sure. add to that, um, if there was a real understanding of having a, an immune system that you understood how to keep your immune system intact by the food choices you make and by um, the chemicals that you eliminate as best you can in your life that even if you were to be um, bit by a, a, a mosquito carrying the Zika, Zika virus, you'd have a better shot at being able to ward this off than someone who's got a toxic body already. And that's rarely taken into consideration when you hear television reports of um, how important that is. Looking at the host rather than the vector itself, you're yes. right. Um, I sure am enjoying this conversation with you. And uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, for our viewers, now you understand why we're doing this interview because this is incredible information. And uh, you know, what I've noticed over the years is that people who are involved in looking at these kinds of things, yourself included, we're all sort of converging on the same message. It's not like there are a lot of divergent messages out there anymore. It's all about living a life that is as reduced in toxic exposure as possible. And another thing you mentioned in your book is the craziness of the castigation of dietary fat that has become so prevalent in, in Western cultures over the past couple of decades. You really come out very much in favor of eating healthful dietary fat. How did you make that discovery and, and what does it mean? Well, you just see it all over the place. Ever since we went on the low fat movement, we've gotten fatter and sicker. Um, I came across a stat. This, this is where it blew my mind. That breast milk, breast milk has almost the exact same percentages of saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, and monounsaturated fat as butter. <laughs> so clearly, nature started us out on a high fat diet. High saturated and fat diet, you know. Exact saturated I, fat. And I so gave a lecture last night uh, and uh, I, I said, you know, even to this day when you, when you read articles online, you never see the term saturated fat without the preface of artery clogging in front of it, even to this day, right. despite right. The, the literature from our most well-respected journals that are telling us it has nothing to do with coronary artery disease. Like as you mentioned, 50% of breast milk uh, fat is saturated fat. So either God got it wrong or nature got it wrong. <laughs> either way, that doesn't make sense to me. We, so, we keep trying to outthink nature. I mean, it was, scientize uh, our food. So you know, the issue then seems to center on uh, being uh, more judicious in regards to our carbohydrate consumption. And that is what, um, you know, I had written nine or ten books on high, high protein, high vegetable, high fat diet. But in, in that, I left a whole wheat grain. If you're going to eat, you eliminate all the whites, all the high starch. I've... You know, you write about what you know at the time. Oh, I have. I'm loving. I know where you're going with this. I love yeah, it. Yeah, to another whole place of. I'm on in your camp. I don't think that we can handle any grain at this point in our life or any sugar. I eat virtually no sugar, and virtually no grain. Every once in a while, a quinoa um, gluten-free pasta because sometimes you just crave it, and I have a. Um, gluten-free flatbread that I occasionally, that's about as far as I go, whereas I used to, you know, a piece of bread here, you sit waiting for the meal to come at the restaurant. And, and by the way, that's another thing. I find eating at restaurants now is like, you know, working your way through a minefield. It's I, so challenging. It, it's so challenging when you really take every food choice seriously. You look at a menu and, and you think, there's nothing here to eat, nothing. I don't want to start a whole tumult in my GI tract again. I've got my GI tract, my stomach flat. All the women out there who just don't know how to get their belly flat, you give up grain, you give up sugar, have a piece of cheese if you're, if you're, you know, when you normally go for the cupcake in the afternoon. Heal, heal that GI tract and once you do that, you look younger, your body looks better, your clothes fit better, you don't have that 
poof through the middle and you don't miss it. That's the big thing. The first two weeks of no sugar is what they describe a heroin addict, you know, withdrawal. It's like you're crawling, you're scratching at the, at the walls and then that passes. I never think about sugar. I just don't think about it. I find when we uh, place people on a very low carbohydrate, eliminating sugar type of diet, they do better when they've been given a, in advance of that, a really comprehensive probiotic. It seems to make their transition, transition a lot easier. You know, you, in, in an email you sent me not long ago, you said something about you went to a regular grocery store for some things and you could only spend $47 because you couldn't find anything. I, I remember that really stuck in my mind for a, for a few weeks. Even and this is, a, this is a chain that promotes itself as healthy and that organic, except that there was hardly anything organic. I think I told you I got organic potatoes and onions that day and and some uh, organic tissues or something. And that was about all I could find. And I wanted food. So, so yes. Um, you interviewed uh, Stephen Sinatra, uh, and we've had him on the program before. Yes. And it, it seems that based upon your interaction with him, as you described, that it was really enlightening to you in terms of not only fat, but also in terms of cholesterol. What did you learn yes. from him? The key thing I learned from him was, I, I, lo I love, in fact, I think the reason you and I know each other is, is uh, as Stephen introduced us. Correct. When he said, I've had guys on my operating table with cholesterol of 320, I think I'm going to go in there and they're going to be riddled with heart disease and nothing. He said, I've had guys on my operating table with cholesterol of 140, 160, and they're riddled with heart disease. So he said, it clearly, um, they're, it's not the cholesterol levels. He said, I don't really care how high your HDL is. He said, I don't really care how high your LDL is. He said, LDL is important because LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol that we've all been taught, is actually what makes the little synapse between the um, neurons in the brain. It's like, you know, they, gotta, they all talk to one another, but they got to be connected somehow. So I, I see the LDL because I have to make everything visual as a little bridge. He said, the only thing I care about is the second component of LDL, which is capital L, small p, little a. He said, if that's high, that's not good. He said, that's like razor blades on the inside of your arteries. He said, but it's rare and it's um, normally genetic, not always. He said, so I can count on two hands the amount of my patients. This is a cardiologist right. who I've put on statins. And I said, so what do you do? And it turns out, is interesting. It turns out my son, who is uh, 50, um, he's, he's, you know, at 50, men are so driven right now. It's that age where have I made it kind of age. And uh, I said, do you, do you ever have your heart checked? And he said, yeah, I just did. So I said, Let me, read me your blood work. So wow. he's reading to me. And I said, what's your LDL? And it was crazy high. So I called Dr. Sinatra. But even with with my son who had crazy high L small p little a second component of LDL he did not put him on a statin he put him on lumbrokinase which is a natural blood thinner and L-arginine magnesium um, a lot of magnesium anyway that was maybe five months ago my son's uh, LP little a is now normal, and he never had to go on a statin. Oh, that's great. So I, I think of all the men in particular, because it's more often they put men on statins, who are in body degrade as a result. They get that muscle wasting uh, disease. What's that? It's I, I'm going to say it wrong. Rhabdomyolysis or rhabdomyolysis. Oh, okay. Rhabdo. And then how do you say it? Just say rhabdo, and everyone will know. Rhabdo. Okay, right. I never get it right. And um, the memory loss of, of men on statins, Statin you know, they're not brain. firing. They're not firing. And the one thing you, I'm telling you, the one thing you have to value so much is your brain. And that's what I really think is most under attack right now in today's world. A, accept that we're living in a different world. We're living in a different world than when you were in medical school, when I was growing up, and then we didn't uh, grow up on organic food because it was organic. You know, they just weren't putting poison on our food at that time. The planet has changed. And unless 
we adjust and accept it, I don't see a good outcome. So what I feel is that we're in charge. Like cancer to me, there's no ninja warrior out there looking and going, oh, I'm going to pick Suzanne right now. I unwittingly made the choices to give myself cancer. Had I known at the time, of course I would not have done that, but I didn't know. And that's the importance of what I write about, what you write about is think about every choice. Before you put that trans fat, that fast food, that, that nitrate filled whatever in your mouth, think about, can you, with the amount of toxicity you're exposed to, can you handle that? Because where's your tipping point? We all have a tipping point. Uh, for some people, it's the air freshener at the airport. As a as a non doctor, I I have to I have to visualize everything to be able to understand it. When I got the visual that the GI tract is the length of a tennis court, and that the immune system is mucus, let's let's look like a, a big rope, the length of a tennis court, and the immune system this is for lay speak for me. Um, is like mucus wrapped around this this rope, this this the length of the tennis court, and in that mucus, that immune system is antibacterial and antiviral and anti-cancer, and we make interferon. So that's this incredible thing that nature has done. But then we start taking anti antibiotics, and anti takes away. And for all the years, when I was in high school, if we'd go to a dermatologist and you had acne, what would they give you? An antibiotic. No one ever said, by the way. Tetracycline in those days. Tetracycline, yeah. No one ever said, if you take it away, anti, you've got to put back pro. So I never took probiotics. I'm, I'm of the thinking now, I, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you, if you uh, take antibiotics unchecked without putting back the, the flora, um, you're, you've now compromised that beautiful immune system and you've allowed for the overgrowth of bacteria so that now those toxins start eating through that immune system and creating the leaks and that's that leaky gut that leaks out into the bloodstream and that's where the trouble begins. Then the toxins go looking for the opportune organs and glands, they like to live in fat and the brain is the fattiest. So what happened in the letters that I started getting from all the women who went on bioidentical hormones uh, because of the other books that I'd written, biologically identical to the human hormone, an exact repli rep replica of what we made in our own body, were saying, I've been taking these hormones according to my lab work. Everything was perfect. I felt great. I, I, you know, I didn't have the, I call it the seven dwarves of menopause, itchy, bitchy, sleepy, sweaty, bloated, forgetful, and all dried up. Didn't have any of those. And then all of a sudden, it stopped working. And I had to sit back and think, what happened? And then you realize if the toxins are making their way up to the brain and you reach a tipping point where you are so toxic as a body, then the hypothalamus, who I call the CEO up there, uh, gets sluggish. The hypothalamus forgets to tell the pituitary, which forgets to tell the adrenal what to do. And pretty soon the whole body's not working right. And um, you know you know better than me what happens with low or high thyroid. It's no joke. It's, it's, it's as serious as anything. It's unexplained weight gain or loss, hair loss, um, uh, brittle nails. That, that's the, the good news. The bad news is the uh, depression or rage, depending. And then that's how the, the antidepressant uh, culture began, I think. I, I read a stat yesterday that blew my mind. One out of every four women in this country is on an antidepressant. So I have to think it's the hormones are imbalanced, and then they get toxic. The hypothalamus is not signaling correctly to give the hormonal signals, and the only way you can calm that brain down is give it an antidepressant, and now you're on this track that can't have a good outcome. You're on what we call a feed-forward cycle, and it really doesn't matter how you jump on this carousel. You can jump on by uh, experiencing stress, uh, mm -hmm. and therefore your HPA axis increases its output and you have higher levels of cortisol that then will change the uh, array of bacteria in the gut and destabilize 
uh, the gut lining, increasing the leakiness or the permeability. Uh, you can go in from another direction. You can traumatize the gut uh, by taking antibiotics or proton pump inhibitors or non-steroid anti-inflammatories and further increase uh, this gut permeability, which creates a stress because you're feeling crappy and that right. activates the HPA axis. So it creates this feed forward a cycle that makes treating people uh, very challenging. And it, it will not work to try to treat an issue that is so multifactorial by jumping on in one area, by giving right. an antidepressant or simply, with all due respect, paying attention to just the gut. You've got to detoxify. You've got to stabilize the hypothalamic pituitary axis, you've got to maximize so many leverage points to get that person back on his or her feet. Well, and what you're essentially saying is the body has to be looked at as a system. It's not separate parts, it's a whole system. So um, if, if you if you got brain issues, you got to start by fixing the gut to stop you know, it's like look at it as, as a house. If you had um, if you had a swimming pool and it had uh, big cracks in it, it doesn't matter how much water you put in the swimming pool; it's going to keep leaking. So you got to seal up the pool. That's what you have to do with your gut. You got to fix. You absolutely right. You've got to treat the fire, not just the smoke. And unfortunately, you know, more so in neurology than other fields, I think that uh, we tend to we in, in quotes tend to focus on symptoms on just treating the tremor of Parkinson's, for example, or the slowness of movement. When we recognize, and you pointed this out in your book, uh, that Parkinson's has been described as being related to toxicity uh, for a couple of decades now, with the original articles actually appearing uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. At the end of the book, you were talking about the importance of probiotics in general, but, uh, but I thought it was really great when you were talking about how you make your own probiotics, how you go through the fermentation process. Tell us what you like to do. Well, I make two things. I make pre prebiotics and probiotics, and it's actually fun. Prebiotics is essentially sauerkraut, and I'm sure sauerkraut um, originated in Eastern European countries where they had long cold winters, but they had big harvests of, of, of cabbage in late spring and they, they last a long time. So sauerkraut so easy. You can buy um, sauerkraut crocs, but you can, you can do it in heavy, heavy duty pots too, but it's easier to go online and buy a croc, shredded cabbage, and then you doctor it up the way you want it. I put caraway seeds and garlic and and there's salt in there and you let it sit for a couple of weeks until it ferments and the excuse me <coughs> excuse god me. bless um, <laughs> thank you what i thought was interesting is that i never under really understood the difference between pre and probiotics prebiotics is actually food for the probiotics so in other words prebiotics makes your probiotic work better so before I take a meal, and some people look at me like it's god awful, I start with a spoon of sauerkraut, and my taste buds are adjusted to it, and I kind I kind of like it, particularly for lunch and dinner. And then um, yogurt is it's so easy. It's just um, we use goat milk because Alan uh, has um, issues with dairy, uh, with cow cow uh, dairy products. And um, it's a just starter culture, and I put the recipe in the book, and that takes you know a few days. You just you can buy yogurt kits, how you can make them, or you can just sure. use jars at home. It, the, all these things were old world, and somehow in the old world, they really knew more than we do today with all our technology. We like we said earlier, we've so tried to outthink nature, and I want to say you know how's it working out? I look around, I see people sick. Everybody's got something, and to be healthy, and I've achieved health, and Alan has achieved health. He's almost, he's, I would say he's 98% there. Achieving health is the greatest achievement in life, besides being a, a good parent and, and spouse and those things of life relative to the human condition. But health, health is all there is. I used to go to um, these dinner parties of this very wealthy man in Beverly Hills, and they gave these fabulous parties and um, the table for 50 and I'd always end up being seated next to him and they bring him in in his wheelchair and his voice because of lack of testosterone and probably every other hormone and all the drugs he was on you couldn't even hear him because his voice was so weak 
no one ever questions why old men and old ladies get such weak little voices. That's the absence of hormones. And um, just to digress for one minute, I sing. I, what I really love to do is sing. I perform in Las Vegas. I've got my own show. And Dr. Jonathan Wright said to me, um, your voice hasn't changed. I said, why would it? He said, well, as you get older without hormones, you lose the strength in your voice. And for men, it goes high. And for women, it goes deep like Lauren Bacall. So anyway, I'm sitting next to this man who is so wealthy. And I looked at him and his lack of health. And he was all bent over and he couldn't walk. And his handlers had to lift him to the table. And I thought, I wouldn't trade my life with you for anything. I have something money could never buy, which is health. And that's why I write, um, and so that people know that we're in charge. I'll say it over and over again. We're in charge. Look how healthy you are. Look how healthy I am. The people, you know, when you look at women, I lecture to women a lot, and I look out, I see women, I can tell who's ill, and I can tell who's, who's a healthy. The healthy ones have a vibrant glow about them. They're ageless. You don't think, you know, that's 60 or that's 70 or that's 50 or that's 40. It's an ageless thing. The unhealthy ones look old when they're young. And you can't imagine that the young, the, the healthy ones roll out of bed and first thing they do is take their antidepressant and then take their diuretic and then take their cholesterol lowering and then take their synthetic hormones. You're not going to look that way when that's your morning ritual. And I also think it's important to say I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. When you need them, you need them. They're a godsend. But if you can go natural first and see what nature has provided first and keep, keep the intake to a minimum, uh, at present, I don't, I don't remember the last time I've had an over-the-counter anything. And the only time I've had a pharmaceutical was when I had my miraculous stem cell breast regrowth um, surgery, which was the most incredible thing I've ever done. Imagine they took my stem cells and fat from my stomach, boo-hoo, and spun out the um, stem cells out of the fat, discarded the weak ones, kept the, the strong ones, put the strong ones back into that fat, and for lack of a better description, with a turkey baster, injected it into my cancer breast and regrew that breast. And to be, there's, a, there's an intelligence in our DNA, so it's not bigger or smaller, it's the same size. And for about a year, I felt in that breast, I can only describe as electrical zippers and that were the blood vessels growing. And every time I would feel that feeling of an electrical zipper, I thought, what an incredible thing I've been able to have access to. So out of every negative comes a positive if you, if you look for it. And I'm that, there, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I applaud you for uh, on so many <laughs> levels and uh, most importantly because you're sharing your quest. And I think it's really a great message for our viewers to, to hear what you have to say uh, that you were not satisfied with the status quo and elected to look into what's, you know, what else is out there, what's going on in the world, and beyond that, that you then shared your quest with all the rest of us. And so I really want to applaud you for that. How can you not? But you are doing the same thing. In fact, what you're doing is very courageous because um, in the allopathic world, it's um, difficult to step out of that. And um, you've had such, such an enormous impact on me, on me. I, because of you, I gave up grain. And I appreciate that. I'm thinner and happier. <laughs> and you look fantastic. I, 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 I love watching you on, uh, what's it, a dancing show? What was it called? Dancing with the dancing Stars. Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, you did great. <laughs> you can tell I don't well, watch a lot of TV. There you go. I thought, you know, at 68, um, I was really impressed with what my body uh, said yes to. And my body said yes to pretty much everything. It went, okay. I, the only thing I said to him was, you don't have to like throw me down on the ground. We don't need to test. Uh, I know I don't have bone loss, but let's not test the yeah, water. You don't need a hip fracture, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Suzanne, my pleasure. And thanks me for too. joining me. And let's I hope we get a again. chance to talk soon. Okay, I'd love to do it again. I'd love talking Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for reading my book. Oh, thank it's you. So for... rare you're interviewed by people who have actually read it. So I thank you so much. Uh, I, I know what that's like, and I'm, sure, I'm yeah. delighted. We'll thank talk you. soon.
Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed that interview. I mean, here is an individual who has faced health challenges and was not satisfied with the status quo and decided to really dig in and learn what was going on and has really achieved a heck of a lot uh, in this world in terms of getting out the information that she's been able to, to gather over the years, writing so many uh, wonderful books. And again, uh, this new book, Toxic, is I think really worth reading. A lot of terrific information uh, in this book written in a way that you'll have no trouble getting your arms around it. So I recommend uh, taking a look at this book. So thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter.